right, assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam sir so today is going to be our 14th lecture and this is our first lecture in the series of discussions that we're going to have on electrons which are still independent they are non interacting but they are inside a periodic potential the periodic potential arises from the crystalline state itself we know that the crystalline state is hallmarked by the periodicity of motifs studded on onto a lattice now these atoms impart a periodic potential landscape inside the crystal so how do electrons behave in the presence of this periodicity so far in the previous three lectures we've looked at electrons from the standpoint of free electrons these electrons were non interacting they were independent and they saw a uniform potential which was taken to be zero which was good for all practical purposes and then uh, we looked at the quantization of the k space uh, we found out the energies we looked at dispersion relationships but now in a real life scenario we do not have a constant potential instead we have an array of ions we're talking about metals these are positively charged k ions which come out because of the nucleus and the core electrons the valence electrons have been denoted to the c but wherever the atoms exist they are almost localized uh, the potential is going to be somewhat different from the remainder of the solid so we have a uh, a potential landscape at the location of atoms the potential is is different from the rest of the atoms so this is these are the locations of the atoms inside the crystal so how do electron waves we know that these electrons are waves and that was our uh, st starting argument for the discussion of free electrons how do these electron waves behave in the presence of this periodic potential now in the two or three lectures that will follow the ideas that i'm going to discuss they are central to the notion of modern condensed matter physics they are really deep concepts in fact they are revolutionary concepts as far as physics is concerned at the same level as gravitational waves at the same level as black holes at the same level as the inflation of the universe though we are not talking about the macrocosm the the universe as a whole right now we have a universe inside a piece of crystal the concepts that are harbored within these crystals they are so fundamentally significant and revolutionary that one cannot help but bow down one's head in in their honor so now what we're going to do today is the first uh, lecture in in this module which i would call the module in which we discuss electrons inside a periodic potential and we'll start off our discussion by looking at weak potential and these potentials are treated as perturbations and i'm going to describe what this means so this is lecture 14 in the subsequent lecture on tuesday which is going to be lecture 15 we're going to look at the other extreme we're going to look at, look at <coughs> strong potential which can also be labeled as the tight binding model and we will see that both of these approaches these two extremes that is whether we have a weakly perturbing potential or a strongly perturbing potential they give rise to what are called bands and band gaps so today's lecture is basically dealing with weak potentials if we have zero potential we have free electrons and if we have a weakly perturbing potential which means that the potential at the sites of the atoms is weak it does not significantly alter it does alter but it does not significantly alter the behavior of the electrons then uh, 
we are treating not free electrons but nearly free electrons so this will be the title of today's lecture okay so we know that uh, inside a crystalline uh, material the potential energy has to be periodic so if r is the lattice vector and this could be defined by these three numbers so le let's call these numbers m1 m2 and m3 so we have m1 a plus m2 b plus m3 c where a b and c are the lattice vectors and m1 m2 and m3 are the integers so we reconstruct the entire lattice here suppose we're talking about primitive lattices monoatomic bases for the time being so let's for simplicity denote this r sub m1 m2 m3 as simply r now we know that if an atom is placed at the location of these lattice points is going to create a potential and we also know that whatever the potential is the potential has to be periodic so if we take the potential energy at some distance r and we would translate by capital r then the potential energy at these two points will exactly be the same because of the periodicity of the crystal now any periodic uh, function whatsoever be it a periodic potential or anything else could be written in fourier form so we've already defined the fourier transform so if i took the potential energy vr and i multiply this with this with this phase factor e this for i k dot r and integrate over all of r i would get what is called the fourier transform of vr the fourier transform is a function of k and i could also rewrite this as v sub k okay now i can rewrite this as v sub k because i know that in 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 the reciprocal space the k's are quantized so the potential is discretized and when anything is discretized the quantity is discretized it's convenient to put the location of that uh, that function in a subscript so k is denotes the index of uh, the potential in the k space so this expression here is called the fourier transform of vr and we've already seen fourier transforms when we were discussing uh, lattices and reciprocal lattices and we saw that the reciprocal lattice is nothing but the fourier transform of the direct lattice so here we have uh, the concept of the <coughs> uh, of, of the fourier transform of a periodic function now these fourier coefficients as they are called can also be determined and this is how you, you determine the fourier coefficient now vr itself can also be expressed in terms of the vk's and ha okay so let me just uh, do some notational so there are different notations that are used different conventions that are used so what i would like to do here i would like to stick to a convention uh, stick to a particular convention so i put a minus sign here l cube so let me rewrite this i am defining the fourier transform of vr so the fourier transform of vr is given by this function here uh the <clears throat> potential itself the periodic potential itself can be expressed as 
वी के डी क्यू के ई प्लस आई के डॉट आर ओवरऑल ऑफ के दिस इज ओवर ऑल ऑफ के ऑल ऑफ आर सो दीज टू रिलेशनशिप्स वन नीड्स टू कीप इन माइंड द सेकेंड रिलेशनशिप एक्सप्रेस इज अ पीरियोडिक पोटेंशियल एज अ फोर ईयर सम ओके इन विच यू टेक अ प्लेन वेव एंड मॉड्यूलेट द प्लेन वेव विद a discrete function v sub k and you integrate over all possible values of k and this v sub k is nothing but the fourier transform of the space potential in space and the fourier transform is defined by taking the function in space multiplying it with another plane wave e is from minus ik dot r and integrating over all of space and for normalization you put the entire volume of the solid in the denominator All right so these are our starting points for a discussion on uh, free electrons now if you look at equation number 1 here any any confusions about equation number 1 all right now we know that this is a periodic function now let's replace this variable k with Uh, something more interesting let's call it let's write now 1 over l cube d cube r r and e raised to the minus i k minus k prime r now if you were to make this substitution and merely the index is going to change so this will become v k minus k prime and if i were to swap the roles of k and k prime i will just swap the roles over here so this v sub k or v sub k prime or v sub k prime minus k is the potential the periodic potential in the k space whenever you would like to transform from the real space to the direct space you take the fourier transform and that's what we are doing here so now we have expressed the periodic potential which is periodic in space into the k space and this is what this potential looks like all right now another uh, object of interest is the following this term here is an integral and the if you look at the electron inside the solid it has a quantum state now the quantum state can be written in the position basis we're recording the spin for the time being but it all can also be written in the k basis okay so i can write the wave function of the electron excuse me the wave function of the electron in the k space as well so if i were to write uh, down this vector here this k vector specifies the state of the electron okay we've seen this in the previous lectures that is if we would like to have these energy levels each energy level is defined by a particular value of k and on top of it you add the information of spin you get the complete spin state uh, the complete state so if we ignore spin for the time being the vector k characterizes a quantum state now if i would like to write down this quantum number k now becomes a quantum number inside a ket this describes a state of the of the free electron and this state of the free electron is nothing physically it's a plane wave okay so if i would to write down the 
this plane wave in the position representation that's what i would like to do i would take the quantum state k which is independent of any coordinates and map it onto the position representation this you learn from quantum mechanics so a plane wave is given by e i k dotted with r and of course i need to normalize as well so this is the normalization factor for a plane wave okay now <clears throat> If I look at this expression here, uh, if if I would take the complex conjugate of this scalar, I would get one over under root b e minus i k dot r. Now I use this information, and I can also express this potential in terms of of these wave functions k and k prime. Now it is immediately obvious. that my v k prime minus k can also be written as the potential v expressed sandwiched between the operators k prime uh, between the states k prime and k okay so this equation here v k prime minus k is nothing but this matrix element where v is some quantum mechanical operator and this integral is an element of that quantum mechanical operator in a particular basis okay so i hope this is clear so this is basic quantum mechanics now i can just express everything over here once again v k prime minus k is the matrix element sandwiched between the states k prime and k and this is equal to an integral and that integral is 1 over l cube d cube r v r e raised to the power minus i k prime minus k dot to the power minus okay so is this clear this is basic quantum mechanics a k state is a plane wave you express it in the position representation it comes out to be this i take the complex conjugate this is what i get now i can use this information and directly feed it into the into these terms this is a plane wave and this is another plane wave i take uh, do budgeting of the signs and it turns out that this factor v sub k prime minus k equals this matrix element v sandwiched between k prime and k okay if I, this could also be written as 1 over l cube v r v r p plus i k minus k prime whatever you choose now this integral here let's call this integral number 2 this matrix element is an integral number 2 now this sum is over all the position vectors all the rs all rs whatsoever so if you would like to find out the potential in k space you integrate over r if you would like to find the potential in the r space you integrate over all the possible states all the possible values of k's okay so each k state is a quantum mechanical state of an electron it is characterized by a quantum vector k we know that if we knew k we also knew what the energy is going to be because it's a free electron h bar square k square m k square is nothing but the magnitude square of the wave vector k so if we knew k the k vector for an electron we can express it as a plane wave we knew what the energy is going to be because we already know what the dispersion relationship for free electrons is and this is where we started off our first lecture when we were discussing free electrons if i were to plot the dispersion relationship for free electrons i plot k here which in short hand i just write as k and i plot the energy here i will get a parabola Okay, which is proportional to k square. 
this is for free electrons not seeing any potential whatsoever <clears throat> now something really interesting happens in this integral number 2 when i sum over all r's this integral always vanishes always goes to zero unless one condition is satisfied <coughs> now <coughs> excuse me could you please carefully glance at this uh, integral and uh, first of all i would like to ask you why is this integral zero in most cases because it's a symmetric function it's a symmetric function on the uh, right side and on the left side of the axis negative may be here or positive may be so when you sum it all up so so it's an exponential function and an exponential function can't be uh, symmetric or asymmetric it's an exponential function So the reason is that this R is taking up all possible values. Okay. Now you have an oscillatory function here. An exponent is an oscillatory function. When R takes up all possible values, these phases can are randomly scrambled between 0 and 2 pi. Okay. Because R takes up all possible values. K and K prime are fixed. We're evaluating this integral at a fixed value of K prime and K. When R is everywhere, it's all around the room, then this phase is going to be scrambled randomly between 0 and 2 pi and uniformly between 0 and 2 pi. And when you take the sum of all of these phases, these are phases pointing in all random directions, the sum is going to be 0. There is only one possibility in which that sum is not going to be 0. And that is when the phase itself is 0. Right? Uh, oh, sorry, the phase itself is some multiple of 2 pi. Okay, if the phase was some multiple of 2 pi, which means that if k prime minus k dotted with r is some multiple of 2 pi, then this term is going to be equal to e raised to minus i 2 pi m, you will get 1. Okay, only in that particular case would this sum be non-vanishing, would this integral be non-vanishing. So this matrix element is like a string of Dirac delta functions. It's zero everywhere, only at certain values in which the k prime and the k hit the right combination. And that combination is when k prime minus k dot r is 2 pi m would would this be equal to 1? Now, when is that condition achieved? Okay. Now, in order to see when that condition is achieved, we already know that if I were to replace this r, small r by small r plus capital R, the integral should not change because v is a periodic function. If v is a periodic function, then since I'm integrating over all r, if I translated the entire potential landscape by capital R, the integral which should not change because I am integrating over all of space. So if I were to do that, so 1 over L cube, D cube R, D R, E uh, <coughs> minus I, K prime minus K dotted with R, must be the same as 1 over L cube D cube V small r plus capital R E minus I K minus K prime sorry K prime minus K that's what I'm what I have over here K prime minus K <coughs> small r plus capital R okay now this function is the same as vr 
because it's a periodic function. So I'm left with one over L cube D cube R D R. I can factor this out as e raised to the minus i k prime minus k dotted with r times the original. This is the original times e raised to the minus i k prime minus k dotted with capital R. Now I'm taking this outside the integral because this integral is merely over small r, and there is no small r in this phase factor. Now, if these two expressions were to remain equal, then this term has to be equal to one, and this term equals one when e raised to the minus i k prime minus k capital R equals one, which means that k prime minus k dotted with capital R has to be equal to an integral multiple of 2 pi. Okay. Now, these lattice vectors are fixed by the lattice. What constraint do we have on k prime and k so that this condition is always satisfied? How are k prime and k related if we were to satisfy this condition? So this is a question that I would like to pose to you. अगर हमने इस condition को satisfy करना है, तो what should be the mutual relationship between k prime and k? K's are points in the reciprocal space. So if k prime minus k hits a particular reciprocal lattice vector g if k prime minus k hits a reciprocal lattice vector g which we know is h a star plus k b star plus l c star and this term would become g dotted with r and this equals 2 pi some multiple of 2 pi some let's call this some p this is an integer this is how we've defined the reciprocal lattice vectors okay so this is a profound result the integral that we have over here this integral which is equal to a matrix element vanishes all the times unless the difference between k prime and k equals a reciprocal lattice vector so let this is such an important thing i would like to write it down so v k prime bra k v cat k prime uh, is that the what i am V, V k and k prime. This equals zero unless k prime minus k equals the reciprocal lattice vector. There are many k points. You choose two k points which are apart by some reciprocal lattice vector. Only in that case would the integral be non vanishing only in that case would this matrix element here which i'm underlining be non vanishing now this condition here you might also recall is simply the bragg's reflection condition if i were to take, take k as the incident wave vector and now we're talking not about x rays or elect we we talking about electron waves inside the crystal and if k prime is the reflected wave the reflected wave exists or scattering takes place when the difference between k prime and k that is the change in the wave vector of the incident electron wave 
which is inside. You're not injecting electrons into the crystal. These electrons are already there inside the crystal. They will be re reflected when the difference between their wave vectors is equal to a reciprocal at spectrum. Now, I'll say more about this about this in a minute uh, when I talk about when I exemplify this relationship in in one dimension. Now, now the point is so with this background, I would like to see how the potential the this potential energy changes the dispersion relationship. Okay, any questions up till this point? So if I plot K here, <clears throat> and K is just a shorthand for this thing, I plot the dispersion relationship, it's going to be a parabola for free electrons. Now what we have inside a, a crystal is that these electrons are behaving like free particles. So they are plane waves. The plane waves can go from left to right, positive K or from left to right or from right to left, negative K. And depending upon the value of K, the energy of these particles is going to be H bar square K square over 2M. So this is the dispersion relationship. Now, on top of this otherwise smooth uniform potential, we add the periodic sieve of periodically arranged potentials Vr. And this is a periodic. And the periodicity is equal to the lattice vector capital R. We've already seen that the potential energy expressed in the K space always vanishes unless k prime minus k equals a reciprocal lattice vector. So armed with this information, we're now going to proceed to see whether this dispersion relationship changes if you were to add this periodic potential. That's the question that lies in front of us. Okay. Now, previously, our Hamiltonian for free electron was simply p squared over 2m where m is the mass of the electron. And later we're going to also see what this mass really means. Now in the presence of a periodic potential, the Hamiltonian is perturbed and the perturbation is given like this. Okay. Now we can express the Hamiltonian in the, uh, in the K space as well. That's not a problem. So this is our modified Hamiltonian. And this term is a perturbation. It's some disturbance to the original Hamiltonian. We know what the eigenstates of this pure Hamiltonian are, this unperturbed Hamiltonian. Let's call it H0. We know what the eigenstates are. The eigenstates are simply plane waves denoted in this fashion. So if I were to write down the plane wave as K vector, in order to write it down and spell it out, I need to put it in some representation. So I put it in the position representation with an energy given by h bar square k square over 2m, which is simply the eigenvalue of this h naught. Now, I would like to find out how does this dispersion relationship change when we add this periodic potential, okay? Now, in order to see this, we apply time independent perturbation theory. There's no time dependence in our problem right now. We're just looking at the energy eigenstates. So we apply the time independent perturbation theory. Now, my question to you is, has everyone studied the time independent perturbation theory? And can anyone give me a brief summary of the time independent perturbation theory? How would we apply the time independent perturbation theory to this problem at hand? We have quantum mechanics two in the last year. I don't exactly remember, but we do VR K 
के परटोबेशन बनाते हैं और फिर मतलब फर्स्ट परटोबेशन जो होती है वो स्ट्रॉगेस्ट होती है सेकेंड मतलब फर्द वीक होती जाती है कैसे निकालते हैं मुझे एग्जैक्टली exactly याद नहीं है वो रिवाइज करना पड़ेगा इससे पहले बताना एनीवन एल्स फातिमा गाजी बिलाल दाऊद यू आर एब्सोल्युटली राइट वी हैव टू लुक एट डिफरेंट ऑर्डर्स ऑफ द करेक्शन वी हैव टू लुक एट द फर्स्ट ऑर्डर करेक्शन द सेकंड ऑर्डर करेक्शन एंड देयर इज अ रेसिपी टू कैलकुलेट दोस करेक्शन टू द एनर्जी सो इफ यू वर टू फाइंड आउट द फर्स्ट ऑर्डर करेक्शन टू द एनर्जी वी वुड सिंपली टेक द परटर्बेशन and sandwich it between the eigen states of the unperturbed function okay and the eigen states of the unperturbed function are given are k are the k's all right so that is what we would like to do now if we if we wanted to do this uh, if you wanted to find out this matrix element this becomes a matrix element now And this of course is equal to an integral so what we could do is we could express this as a fourier integral v r e raised to power minus or uh, doesn't matter plus or minus so let me just use v r i want to look at my definitions because there is always uh, an arbitrary choice of definitions that you would like to do so here i am b k is minus with a minus sign okay it won't make a difference but still i'm being going to minus i k minus k which is zero dotted with r r and this is 1 over l q okay now this term is simply 1 and this is just the integral of the potential function this is going to give me some constant it does not depend upon k okay because the k has just been washed away so whatever the integral is it's going to be some constant v not okay so the first order correction is some constant v not but the constant does not really perturb us it does not disturb us the constant can always taken to be equal to 0 because what this constant is going to do it's going to shift the dispersion relationship up and down up and down it's not going to make any difference whatsoever the only k dependent only energies which become k dependent uh, corrections which become k dependent are concerning us here so remember that we, when we were talking about free electrons we took the liberty of choosing the potential the constant potential to be equal to 0 that's what we can do for the first order correction here so the first order correction doesn't really matter it's a constant however the second order correction does matter and if you would like to use the recipes that are provided by the time independent perturbation theory the second order correction can also be found and the second order correction can be found in this manner v the potential energy function in the and we have to put it in the k space so eigen vector k sandwiched between another eigen vector k prime and you in a denominator you have the difference in their energies unperturbed energies e not at k minus e not at k prime okay and then you would like to sum up over all k over all k primes but this function here this matrix element vanishes unless k prime equals k plus j k plus g so you only need to sum up over those combinations of k prime and k which have the right difference and that difference vector is equal to the reciprocal lattice vector so this is how we would calculate the second order correction all right so do you get this now let's uh, 
let's look at something really interesting. So keep this thing in your mind. So let's call this equation number two. This is the perturbative correction. Okay. So <clears throat> now if you look at the denominator here, if you look at the denominator here, this e prime e at k and e at k prime, k prime is related to k, k prime minus k has to be equal to g. And when that happens, what do we get? When k prime minus k equals g, we would like to find out what the energies are. So when e at k prime, which is e at k plus g, so we would like to see what happens here. What happens here? How are these energies related? Re related? So what is the relationship between the energy at K prime and the energy at K? So we know that these K prime is simply equal to K plus G. So we would like to know how is this related to, excuse me, E at K, E not at K. Because in the denominator, we have the difference between the energies at K and K plus G. All right. So at this point in time, I would like to draw the dispersion relationship again. So here is K. Here is my dispersion relationship. If at what point would these energies, if these energies were equal, if E naught at K were equal to the E naught at K plus G. So when these energies are going to be equal, we cannot simply put a zero in the, in, in the denominator. Therefore, we have to use another form of perturbation theory, which is called degenerate perturbation theory. And that's what we would like to do at the moment. Now, in order to simplify this uh, discussion, let's talk about one dimensions. So instead of k, I can just put kx here. And here is my dispersion relation hk square over 2m. Now, I know that in one dimensions, if I plot the k space, I have some zero value. I have some points in the k space. And if I were to take two points that were apart by a reciprocal lattice vector G, okay, symmetrically around the zero position, I know that my length of G, which is the lowest order G, is of, I know what this length is going to be. This is going to be 2 pi over A. So the reciprocal lattice vectors are multiples of 2 pi over A. The smallest reciprocal lattice vector is has, has a length 2 pi over A. So if I were to take this k point, which is at pi over A, and this k point, which is at minus pi over A, then these points are separated by a reciprocal lattice vector in the k space okay now on top of this if i were to draw the dispersion relationship i will immediately i know that the dispersion relationship is symmetric about k equals 0 and at these points which are at plus pi by a and minus pi by a the energies are equal, okay? And the separation in the K space between these points is equal to G. So K prime minus K equals to G for two points, 
in the k space which are apart by 2 pi over a all right so in so in the reciprocal space these two points at pi by a and minus pi by a they are apart by a, the length of a reciprocal lattice vector and their energies at these points are also equal therefore at these points which i've shown by dashed lines the energies are equal and the two points are are distant apart from one another by the reciprocal lattice vector okay hence if i were to consider these points the denominator in this second order perturbation term is going to be equal to zero and i know that the numerator only exists is non zero when i take two points which are g units apart and this happens for the first time this happens at these two points which are at plus pi by a and minus pi by a you take any other point inside this zone first time i'm using this word zone you take any two points and you take the difference between k prime and minus k and look at the potential at that k prime minus k the perturbation the correction to the perturbation is turning out to be zero it's only at the vicinity of the boundaries of this zone that the denominator is going to become very close to zero and so the second order perturbation is going to be significantly large okay therefore we need to consider these special points which are at the boundaries of the so called zone and i'm going to uh, denote uh, donate i'm going to actually don donate it a special lecture to these zones these zones are called brillouin zones and these points here are boundaries of the first brillouin zone now let's look at the second order perturbation correction when these two k points that are separated apart by g vector and their energies are also equal how does the second order perturbation term look like okay any questions at all other instances the second order perturbation is zero is almost zero because the numerator vanishes it's only at the boundaries of this zone that the denominator really picks up and the numerator does not vanish that we do need to consider the second order perturbation i hope this is clear uh, let me reiterate this in urdu फ्री इलेक्ट्रॉन्स की कोई एनर्जी है कोई डिस्पर्शन रिलेशनशिप है वो पैराबोलिक है ठीक है फर्स्ट ऑर्डर परटेबेशन करेक्शन एक कांस्टेंट है वो हमारे किसी काम का नहीं है उसको हम इग्नोर कर सकते हैं जीरो के बराबर रख सकते हैं सेकंड ऑर्डर परटेबेशन करेक्शन आपकी आंखों के सामने है इक्वेशन नंबर टू है यहाँ पे ठीक है इसमें न्यूमरेटर हमेशा जीरो ही होता है ज्यादातर जीरो ही होता है क्योंकि न्यूमरेटर उसी वक्त नॉन जीरो होगा जब k प्राइम माइनस के एक रेसिप्रोकल लैटिस वेक्टर के बराबर है ठीक है और हमने देखा कि वो रेसिप्रोकल लैटिस वेक्टर के बराबर उस वक्त है जब k की जो दो वैल्यूज हैं k प्राइम और k की वो जोन की बाउंड्रीज पे हैं और उस पॉइंट पे एनर्जीज भी बराबर हैं तो ऐसे हालात में हमें डिनोमिनेटर जीरो के करीब आ रहा है न्यूमरेटर नॉन जीरो है तो हमें कुछ ना कुछ करना पड़ेगा और वो क्या कुछ करना है वो ये है कि हमें डी जनरेट परटेबेशन थे का सहारा लेना पड़ेगा इस सेकंड ऑर्डर करेक्शन को मालूम करने के लिए ठीक है एनी क्वेश्चन जो कोई और पॉइंट्स होंगे जो हमारे पे बाउंड्री पे नहीं है लेट्स से हमने ये दो पॉइंट्स नहीं लिए एंड वी टेक सम रैंडम पॉइंट इन दिस ग्रीन रीजन तो एक तो हमारा यहाँ पर के हो जाएगा तो जो के प्राइम है वो सिचुएशन में कहां पे जाएगा अगर वो जी से ही इसकी डिस्प्लेसमेंट है दूसरे पॉइंट्स 
All right, now what we would like to do is, is the following. So we would like to use the degenerate perturbation theory to, in order to find out the second order correction. All right, so by the way, let me just uh, uh, put the cart before the horse a little bit and just give me one or two minutes to talk about the Brillouin zone. We'll have a special lecture on this. So in one dimensions, this is Kx, pi by A minus pi by A. So this is the reciprocal lattice vector. Okay, from minus pi by a to pi by a. So these are separated about by two pi. Any two points that are separated out by two pi over a is going to be a reciprocal lattice vector. So if I were to take this point two pi over a here, then I could also connect my point zero with two pi over a. This is also going to be a reciprocal lattice vector. So if I were to take the tail of my reciprocal lattice vector to lie at the origin, Okay, I could draw two kinds of reciprocal lattice vectors. One is G, but minus G is also a reciprocal lattice vector, right? So now I've drawn two reciprocal lattice vectors whose tails lie at the origin and I can only go left and right because I'm in one dimensions. Now, if I were to take these reciprocal lattice vectors and bisect them, so I put a bisector here and I put a bisector here. Okay, this zone here in between the bisectors of the two reciprocal lattice vectors, this is called the first Brillouin zone. Okay, uh, I, let me now express this in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, I have a K space. This is my zero of the K space. So let me call this the KX axis. Let me call this the KY axis. So this is point one zero. This is point zero one. This is point one one and so on, right? So this is minus one zero. This is minus one one and so on. So now I'm at the reciprocal lattice point zero, and I draw my reciprocal lattice vectors one by one. This is one of them. This is another one of them. This is the third one of them. This is the fourth one of them. So I can draw four reciprocal lattice vectors, G1, G2, G3, and G4, okay, at the origin of this K space. Now I can take the bisectors. I take a bisector here. 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 This region here in the K space is called the first Brillouin zone. And I can extend this to three dimensions. I can also draw uh, the second Brillouin zone, the third Brillouin zone. And this is a really nice puzzling exercise to do so. And we'll do that in one of our lectures, probably uh, two lectures from now. G Heather. Sir, you have made Brillouin zones. In this case, you have made a square. But if you are taking by sectors, these are not necessarily going to make a square. They can make a rectangle as well. So, Yes, yeah, so if I have a square lattice, they're going to make a square. If I have a rectangular lattice in two dimensions, it's going to make a rectangle. Right? On either side, on either side, we equal distance along X and along K, Y, we different. Uh, see. Okay, so it could be a rectangle like this. Okay. Yes. Sir. Or a rectangle like this. So these are the bisectors. And the first Brillouin zone is the area circumscribed by the first inside the first points of intersections of all of these bisectors. This is called the first Brillouin zone. Okay. Now let's now now we're going to use the degenerate perturbation theory, uh, and we would like to find out the second order correction. Now how do we do that? So in order to do that, we look at our Hamiltonian, we diagonalize the Hamiltonian. 
so in the if we had the unperturbed state k and k prime were our eigen states these were our eigen states now we write the hamiltonian in the unperturbed eigen basis okay so our hamiltonian h in the unperturbed eigen basis will comprise of four elements a Okay, so these are the four elements. Okay, got it. Now, in the unperturbed basis, the what the potential we already know that the potential energy V. When, if I were to put V here, so H has two terms. H has an H naught and a V. So if I look at the top left term. If I were to take V here, the V component, the perturbation inside H, and I sandwich it between two eigenstates k and k, the answer is going to be zero. K and k prime have to be different for the uh, matrix term that comprises the potential to be non-zero, and they have to be different by a certain amount, and that is G. Okay. So if I were to write down these matrix elements, the first element is simply going to be equal to E naught at K. This is the unperturbed energy. And here we have E naught at K prime. The bottom right, we have E naught at K prime. This term over here, the top left term. So let's first look at the bottom right term. The bottom right term, we've already determined. The the H naught is diagonal in the original eigen basis. So when this is diagonal, if I put H naught here, the matrix element will be zero. So I only need to consider V, K, and K prime here. Okay, and here I consider K V sandwich between K and K prime in this fashion. Okay. So now these terms we've already calculated. And these terms, by the way, are non-zero only when k prime minus k equals some reciprocal lattice vector. Okay, so I can express this as e naught at k, e naught at k prime. At the top right, I at the bottom left first I get v, k prime minus k, and v at k prime minus k has to be equal to some g. Okay. And this is just a complex conjugate here, because the k and the k prime they are they are as you know plane waves. So if I take the complex conjugate, the plus sign in the exponent becomes a negative sign, and that is just merely reflective of the fact that we're taking complex conjugation. And by the way, v r is real, and that's why we are able to do this. So the bottom, the left, at the bottom left we have v g, and at the top right we have v g. Complex conjugate. So this is our Hamiltonian written in the unperturbed basis. And degenerate perturbation theory says that we would like to diagonalize this Hamiltonian. <clears throat> Now, how do we diagonalize? In order to diagonalize, we have to look at some eigen basis. What is the eigen basis? If the Hamiltonian were unperturbed, the eigen basis, of course, we knew they're going to be the k and the k prime states. But now the eigen basis has changed. It's some combination of k and k prime. So H acting on this ket gives me the energy. <clears throat> so this means that E naught k. V excuse me. excuse me so let me share my screen again is 
is the recording still working yes it is so <clears throat> what i could do now so somehow my one pad is now stuck a little bit <laughs> so e not k vg star vg e not k prime i can express this as alpha beta as a column vector alpha beta equals e alpha beta and my task is to find out this this is my unknown i would like to find out the the new eigenstates and the new eigen energies okay now in order to solve this uh, eigen value equation i can find out what the characteristic equation is going to look like that characteristic equation is going to look like this e not k minus e vg star vg e not k prime minus e this determinant square this must be equal zero okay and i can solve this for e मसला फिर शुरू हो गया राइट सो दिस बिकम्स ई नॉट के मल्टीप्लाइड विद ई नॉट के प्राइम माइनस वी जी मॉड स्क्वेर इक्वल्स जीरो ऑल राइट so at the zone boundaries let's first see what happens at the zone boundaries at the zone boundaries k prime is k plus g and e not at k prime is equal to e not at k right because of the dispersion relationship when that happens i will get e not k minus e whole square equals mod square now if i were to solve this i would get e equals my new energy equals e not k plus minus vg okay so i get these two energies all right one minute of silence here while i explain what's going on <clears throat> all right so at the zone boundaries my eigen states are no longer plane waves they are other superposition of plane waves right with some values of alpha and beta which we can always find out and the energies of these superposition of plane waves is no longer e not k rather the perturb rather the energies have perturbed and that perturbation is equal to the strength of the potential at the vector reciprocal at its vector g so you express the potential in the k space and find out what is the value of the potential the fourier coefficient of the potential at the reciprocal at its vector g <clears throat> and the energy is perturbed by that much at the zone boundaries so let me draw this let me first of all draw what's going on so let me draw the unperturbed potential <clears throat> i 
as a as a dashed line and suppose that these points here are my zone boundaries pi by a and minus pi by a now what's happening is that in most of the cases i'm far away from the zone boundaries there's hardly any change to the dispersion relationship let me extend this beyond the boundary as well okay when i am at the if if i didn't have any periodic potential this would be my energy which i'm shown showing as dotted lines <clears throat> at the zone boundaries at precisely h bar square k square over 2m which is equal to e not k <coughs> but now i have a different scenario my energies are rather different from this e not k and the difference is by factor of vg so if i'm approaching this zone boundary from the below i must end up here at a point vg below the unperturbed energy so my dispersion relationship takes a slight turn it doesn't go all the way up to my unperturbed energy it falls short of it by some amount which is equal to the value of the periodic potential in k space computed at the reciprocal lattice vector g likewise beyond the zone boundary the unperturbed wave function goes up but now instead of starting at the unperturbed energy it starts from slightly higher value and this distance is again vg so now this energy level diagram or this dispersion relationship has been punctured at the zone boundaries it has been interrupted and there are certain energies which suddenly become disallowed they become forbidden so so this is what is called a band gap this band gap arises out of the degenerate perturbation theory okay now the, you can extend this process you can keep on extending this process on and on and on so if the difference between two k points is 2g still you would see the same effect so if i were to draw this dispersion relationship and extend it to longer and longer values of k so here i'm plotting it only in 1d by the way so i make this dispersion relationship this is my first zone boundary so this is pi by a this is minus pi by a this is 2 pi by a minus 2 pi by a So now these points here are also separated by a reciprocal lattice vector, which is two G. If G is a reciprocal lattice vector, so is two G. Likewise, we can have other points, three pi by a and minus three pi by a. At at these and uh, uh, these pairs of points, okay, which are separated by G, two G, three G, the energies are going to be equal, and they're separated by by a reciprocal lattice vector so we have to use degenerate perturbation theory if we were to use degenerate perturbation theory exactly in the same fashion we will get identical splittings okay and so i can plot these the new dispersion relationship by introducing these gaps in this fashion okay so these gaps are created so let me uh, show that certain values of energy suddenly become unallowed so these become gaps these are gaps that show up the green regions are regions of energy in which no k state exists no no point exists no state exists in these forbidden gaps
these are my forbidden gaps. And I can draw a better version of the dispersion relationship like this. Yeah, you see, I get this, I get this, I get this, this. Okay. Slightly <laughs> difficult to draw all of this, but nevertheless. So this is my K x i'm talking one dimensions these are my this is my energy dispersion ratio these are my gaps this gap is 2 vg this gap is 2 v 2 g and likewise i get two times v at 3 g and so on okay so these gaps show up and these sets of k's they form a band this is a band this is the lowest band this is an, and then we have upper bands and upper bands, and there are gaps between these bands. And physically, what, what's really happening is <clears throat> now, in order to give a more physical feel for all of this, let, let me focus and spell out the physicality of this in one dimension. Let me choose a periodic potential. Just a toy potential. So I'm in one dimension. So I'm just using X instead of R. Suppose my potential is is like a cosine function. So my potential is a cosine function, say V naught is v naught here cosine of 2 pi x over a suppose so so this is my a okay so this is a periodic potential okay we we know that our now of course you know that this periodic potential can be expressed as a fourier series in this case the fourier series is very simple there's only one non-zero fourier coefficient so anyway this is a periodic potential now what we would like to do is we would like to find out the first of all we, we've already determined the energies are going to be h bar squared k square over 2m but at, at or near the zone boundaries they are going to be perturbed and we can calculate how much they're going to be perturbed but let's look at the eigenfunctions so the away from the zone boundary. So this is a zone boundary. And this is another zone boundary. What we could now do is uh, we could look at our characteristic equation. Go, go back here. Look at this equation here. This thing here. In fact, even go before, look at this equation here. We can also find what Vg is going to be. And you can look it up that this Vg is simply going to be equal to V0. Okay. So Vg is equal to V0. And you can calculate this as a do-it-yourself problem. And then you're going to be left off with an eigenvalue equation of this kind. E naught at k, V naught star, which is simply V naught, you get V naught here, and E naught uh, k here. So if, if two points are separated out by G, E naught K plus G is going to be the same as E naught K. So I have this matrix and I have alpha beta here and this equals uh, E alpha beta. Okay. So now if I were to look at this equation here, this 
so let me see just give me a second please let me show you the final result for this okay so e naught k alpha plus v naught beta is equal to e alpha so what this tells us is that e naught k alpha plus v naught beta now e we've already determined at the zone boundary suppose <clears throat> this is equal to e naught k plus v naught I'm looking at the higher energy band, which is beyond the uh, zone boundary. So it's plus sign here with alpha here. Okay, this goes away. This goes away. And I'm left with beta equals alpha. And if I were to use minus sign here, I would let be left with beta minus alpha. Okay, so there are two eigenstates. One eigenstate is K. over under root 2, which is really k plus k plus g over under root 2. And the other is k minus k prime over under root 2, which is simply k minus k plus g over under root 2. So my two eigenstates are k plus minus k prime over under root 2. And this factor of under root 2 is for normalization. So these are my eigenstates. Let's call them psi plus my minus. And the energies are E plus and E minus, which are given by E naught k plus minus V naught. So now if I were to look at the energy eigenstates that exist at the zone boundary, away from the zone boundary, my eigenstates are simply plane waves. At the zone boundary, my eigenstates change. They're no longer the plane waves. Rather, they are superpositions of plane waves and equal superpositions with a plus sign or a negative sign in between them. So the components could be 180 degrees out of phase or zero degrees in phase with one another. But the plane waves no longer remain eigenstates. Rather, we get superpositions of plane waves at the zone boundaries. So at the zone boundaries, my psi plus and psi minus look something like this. E in the position space, they look as E i k x plus E plus minus i k x. Render two. And of course, I need to normalize as well. So, my, so, so these functions are proportional to either, they, they look like cosine of uh, kx and sine of kx. Got it? But my k's at the zone boundaries, so these k's are really plus minus pi over a. So at the zone boundaries, I have cosine of pi x over a, and I have sine of pi x over a. It doesn't matter if I put a plus or a minus sign here, because if I were to take the probability density, I just take the squares. So now if I were to plot my potential again this is a cosine like function periodicity a and at the zone boundaries my solutions or my eigenstates to the schrodinger equation they look like cosine square and sine square so i have a cosine square function for one of them, this is psi modulus square. This is the probability density. And I have sine square for, for, for the other. 
eigen state and one of them is higher energy so when the potential is high if the probability density is high this will lead to the higher energy function because the electron is spending most of its time at a region of higher potential so this leads to higher overall energy this leads to lower energy overall because where the potential is high the probability density is low where the potential is is lowest the and probability to spend most of its time at the low potential regions far away from the exactly in between the ionic cores so at the zone boundaries we do not get these plane traveling waves plane waves are traveling waves at the zone boundaries what is happening is that we have a wave a k wave and a k prime wave the k prime wave has uh, the exponent with a minus sign e is for minus i k x so one is a left traveling wave superimposed with a right traveling wave both have the same wavelengths but opposite signs and when they combine with one another they form a standing wave so we we can visualize that at the zone boundaries what is happening is the following at the zone boundaries we have this arrangement of atoms a wave is coming e i k x and another wave is receding e raised to the minus i kx at the zone boundary reflection from these atoms for the electron waves is taking place scattering is taking place and the k prime which is the wave number of the scattered wave is different from the wave number of the incident wave by a reciprocal atoms vector this could be plus g or this could be minus g okay so the change in the k is equal to a reciprocal atoms vector okay and that's is, is is what you observe here k is in one direction k prime is in the other direction so if this difference in these k vectors is equal to a reciprocal atoms vector bragg scattering of the electron waves inside the crystal takes place and a standing wave is formed to counter propagating waves if their phases are correct they form a standing wave uh, and the standing wave has properties probability densities of this form that i've drawn in red over here so the upshot is that in the nearly free electron model the energies remain somewhat parabolic but at the zone boundaries they change they are interrupted gaps appear in the dispersion relationship certain energies become totally forbidden okay and uh, that is the our first connection with the idea of uh, of a band gap so in the next lecture i'm going to uh, take this concept a little bit forward i'm talk going to talk about the effective mass of the electron i'm going to recap all of this very briefly and succinctly and i'm go also going to look at the other extreme in which the potential is so strong that the electron has very little opportunity to hop out of the potential well so it remains on, on on an atom it has very little opportunity to become free what kind of band structure uh, arises in conditions of this kind all right so thank you very much i'm sorry it's a slightly longer lecture but these are very intricate concepts uh, it is hard to put them in front of you in the form of a digital board but nevertheless uh, i've tried so any questions all right so this uh, material you can look up in in simon's book uh, steve simon's book there's a very nice chapter on nearly free electrons there and i'm going to upload some material uh, vis a vis the landau quantization as some student had requested for it all right so thank you very much uh, and inshallah see you on tuesday and on thursday we're going to have our midterm so shukriya khuda hafiz